Well, I imagine that any person or people who set off to move to a new land often go with an exaggerated idea of how good it's going to be on the other side. When I was growing up, one of the first videos I ever saw in the theater was An American Tale. And it's an animated story of this family of mice, and they're immigrating from Russia to the U.S., and the voyage is hard, it's difficult. They sing this song that tells them how great it's going to be in America. And they sing this song, they say, there's no cats in America. <laughs> yes, and you guys are all laughing already. And the streets are paved with cheese. And now, I happen to know that in America there's plenty of cats, and I have never seen a cheese sidewalk ever, or a street. But life here was just as difficult as it was in some ways back in Russia for, for these mice. In the same way for our exiles, last week we looked at Ezra chapter 1 as God sent the exiles back to the land, the land of promise. And I'm sure they went with a lot of hopes, a lot of dreams about what it could be back in Jerusalem. And this week we pick up in chapter 3 where we see that they in fact have some trials. There's things they couldn't anticipate, difficulties that confront them. And we're going to see three things that they do in this chapter. They're going to, first of all, worship as a matter of first priority. Worship will be their primary first step in this new land. Second, they are going to build this temple, this new place, in accordance with God's design. Then finally, they're going to celebrate these small, small beginnings. So let's turn with me to Ezra chapter 3, and we're going to begin. You can follow along in your scripture sheet in the bulletin or up here on the screen. So we see them, right off, right off the bat here, begin with worship. So what do they do? Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this, When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So one of their first acts of business when they get back to the new land is to build this altar on which they're going to offer sacrifices in accordance with the law of Moses. Why do they start here? The next verse is very, very interesting. Here is verse 3. They set the altar in its place. Why? For fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it, burnt offerings morning and evening. So notice it says that they were afraid, and the first thing they do is they build an altar. Now it doesn't really tell us what they were afraid of. It just tells us whom they were afraid of. They were afraid of the peoples of the land. We don't know much about them. We bump into them again in Ezra chapter 4, and there they come and they offer to help build the temple too. They're like, hey, we want in on this great project. Let, let us help. And the exiles who are returning say, no, we got this. And immediately the people of the land hold the whole project up in red tape. So they're antagonistic. They're not exactly the most helpful people, even if they offer some help. And so they, they know that these people are a threat, and their very first thing that they want to do is go and build this altar. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of being afraid, there's other things like they put in place first. You could think, hmm, maybe if I, my city's destroyed, maybe I would want a nice, big, strong wall around it, Right? In that day and age, that, that was your primary means of defense. Nice, big, thick, strong walls around your city. It's going to take them 100 years before they have a city wall. They start with an altar, a vulnerable altar out in the middle of a pile of ruins. Now, you and I today might be thinking, NATO, can we get some more missile shields put in place? Can we get some more defense? Can we get more subs out there? Right? Our first thought is, like, get the defensive mechanisms out there. Protect us. But their first step is to begin with worship. Why begin there? Why start with an altar, not with the city walls? Well, perhaps when we give ourselves to trying to satisfy our fears, you never really finish the project. You ever notice that, however, you start 
addressing one fear, then the next morning it's something different, something else filled its place. It's like playing whack-a-mole at the, at the carnival, right? Boom, boom, boom. So today it might be Ukraine, tomorrow it might be inflation. By Tuesday morning, maybe it's your blood pressure. There's always a new thing to be afraid of. And so if we just give all of our energy into taking care of our fears, we'll never get around to actually being unafraid. It will always be there. There's always a risk because we're human, we're vulnerable. There will always be a risk there. And so that's why they give themselves to worship. Because worship redirects our focus away from our fears onto something that's much more powerful, that can actually address our fears. This week, I've had plenty of opportunity to practice this. And I'm sure you have too, where you're scrolling through, you've got, oh man, there's another thing about routine. Let's figure out what's going on. And if I just sit in a news cycle, my, my anxiety begins ticking up and I can feel it. But something about worship is stopping and saying, you know what, God, we just looked at passages last week that showed how you were the king of the universe even when the Babylonians were in charge. Can I believe that now? Can I praise you as the God of the world now? And even this morning, as we were singing the song, The Great I Am, I found myself, yes, God is the self-existent one. Everybody else, Putin, you name it, we're all dependent upon something else. God is the only I am. And I found myself, this, I could let go of the news and grab onto this claim of who God is. So worship moves us past our fears to trusting in a person that is powerful enough to take care of the problems that confront us. And so we see that these returning exiles give themselves the first order of business, and that is worship. Get the altar set up. Worship God. That is the first order of business. Second thing we're going to see is that they build this new temple. This is going to be called the second temple. So the first temple was Solomon's temple. That was destroyed by the Babylonians. The one that gets erected here and continues on to the first century before it's destroyed by the Romans, that's called second temple. And so people talk about second temple Judaism. They're talking about that span of time from the return up until the collapse of the second temple during the, under the uh, Roman occupation and the Jewish war there. They're going to build this, and they're going to follow God's covenant patterns for doing so. so let's check this out. Verse 4. And they kept the feast of booze as it is written and offered daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. A couple of things are significant about this. First of all, when Solomon built his temple, the very first festival they ever held there was the Feast of Booze. The Feast of Booze was one of the three festivals where everybody had to go up to Jerusalem. The other ones were Passover and Pentecost. This was one where everyone had to assemble in front of Jerusalem in the temple. And so they're all doing this together. Again, they're celebrating this. And part of the celebration is to build a little booth in which to remember. And part of that remembering is remembering that in the past, God's people had been in the wilderness. They had been dwelling and mobile, and then God brought them into a promised land. Here's Leviticus. When the expectations for this festival were outlined. Here's what it says. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. Why? That your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I and the Lord your God. And so here's this new experience for the people of God. They've come on from out from the Persians, being sent back to their land to rebuild their walls, I'm sorry, their temple, their land. And that sounds a lot like what God did in the past when God brought them out from underneath the Egyptians. He brought them into the promised land so they would live there and dwell and plant their vineyards. And once again, God is bringing his people out of a foreign land back to their home. And so this is a beautiful picture. You can imagine this is the first festival that, that they get to hold is this festival of booze that reminds them what God has done in the past, and also just frames this experience that they're having together. That God is this powerful God who can liberate us from the clutches of the foreign empires. And he can even fund his own temple project. So returning back to chapter 3 in Ezra, it says this, And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings of the new moon, and all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone made a freewill offering to the Lord. 
From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So again, they've start to, started the sacrifices even without a foundation to this new building in existence. They then begin work on this new temple. And it says they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. And so the same materials that they use in the first temple, they go and acquire for the second temple. Solomon used the cedars of Lebanon to build that first one. They also go and they buy them. Now, for many years, I believed cedars of Lebanon were these big, tall, majestic trees like the, the redwoods out in California. And I thought, man, they're just going to be these huge, massive things. And so when we went to Lebanon a few years ago, I was like, I have to go see these things. And I was disappointed in that they weren't really these tall, majestic trees. They were these short, squatty trees. They live on top of a mountain, and because of the wind, snow, and ice, and things in the wintertime, they, they break off. And so their height is actually not very tall. What they do is they grow wide and fat. And so here, I'm trying to hug one, and as you can see, I'm not succeeding. This is one of the older ones, and it's, I think it was a couple thousand years old. So that probably was around during this time. Somehow it escaped the loggers. And I was able to give it a big hug, at least a partial hug in that picture. But th these trees are still beautiful. They're just different than how I imagined them in my, my feeble imagination. And so they go and they acquire these cedars. And there's a prophecy that's beautiful from Isaiah that anticipated this moment when the glory of Lebanon would return back to Jerusalem. Here's Isaiah 60, verse 13. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the pine, the fir, and the cypress together to adorn the place of my sanctuary, I will make the place of my feet glorious. And so here they are, again. This temple project's been funded by Cyrus. They're coming back. They're acquiring these beautiful trees, building it again just as the first one was built. So we've seen a couple different things. We've seen that they worshiped as a first priority. They've, we've seen that they've been building it according to God's design, and here they continue, again, worshiping and building this together. Now, in the second year, after they're coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, made a beginning, together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. The Levites and the priests were the ones in charge of the temple, and so it's not surprising that we see them here being the primary builders of the temple. They're the ones involved with building this new structure to worship God. And what we've seen is that they worship God even before this temple is even built. And what it suggests is that buildings, while they're definitely fun and they're definitely helpful, they're not essential to the worship of God himself. And so while it is very helpful to have the worship band up here every Sunday, during 2020, in the pandemic, we met outside and worshiped God. Because you can do it in a building like this, but you can also do it outside. A building is not essential to the worship of God. They were worshiping regardless of whether they had a building in place. Even they didn't have a foundation at this point in place. And so the worship happens even before the building begins. And so they're building this structure. They're excited about the work. And then we see that they begin to celebrate small beginnings. Because they only build a foundation. And they decide, we need to celebrate this. So check this out. Verses 10 and 11. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Note, just the foundation of the temple of the Lord. You got that? The priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the, to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. Here's what they sang. For he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. 
And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So we're going to look at three different aspects of this celebration. The first thing that we see is that they're celebrating something about God, that God is faithful, that he has steadfast love. In Hebrew, this word is kesed. And scholars have done a lot of work trying to figure out what does this term capture it. And so there are times in the Old Testament where it seems to mean faithfulness, that God holds up his end of the bargain, that when he makes a covenant with Israel, he doesn't betray them. But other times, Kesed seems to capture this idea of mercy, that God extends mercy. When his people are unfaithful, God is still faithful. God still rescues them. So he, here they are, right? Part of their history, we looked at last week, was that Israel had rejected God's covenant. And as a result, God removed them from the land. And now here they are, receiving God's mercy. God's bringing them back. Do they deserve this? No. They have not been faithful, and yet God's going to take them out of this foreign empire, put them back in their land, have this new temple funded by a foreign king. That's God's mercy. And part of what they celebrate here is that God has been overly merciful. Yes, they're not past the foundation, but they've seen God's faithfulness, God's steadfast love at work. And I think this is an invitation for you and I to celebrate God's faithfulness, his steadfast love, wherever we experience it. To not hold those stories in. Philosophers identify our current time as a secular age. And what that means is that when you turn on the news or listen to talk radio even, oftentimes what you're not going to hear about is God. And so that, that place of what the divine is doing, what God is doing, usually does not get talked about. We talk about what we're doing, human actors, governments, all those things. We, we talk about those things. And so after a while, what happens, I think, and I find this happening to my own heart, we can begin to believe that it's just humans here. That really, since we suspend talking about God elsewhere, we begin to think, well, maybe, maybe it's just us. And one of the things that we need, and I find myself yearning for, is knowing those places in the world where God is at work. I want to know those places because our society, our culture doesn't help us identify those things. And one of the things that celebration can do is it helps each other identify, oh, that was God. Oh, this is something I've wanted for a long time, couldn't manufacture on my own, and God just did this. And so celebrating, telling the stories about where God's been at work, that helps others begin to say, wait, it's not just me. It's not just my effort. God's grace and mercy are active here. And one of the things we do encourage people, as we're doing PBJ, to do is to tell the stories. Not because you're somebody great, but simply because you've, you've witnessed a place where God has been at work. Because that encourages our hearts. We need to know that God is here. It's not just our savvy invitations. No, we need to know that God is calling people to himself. And so as they stop and then they celebrate this beautiful thing that they've observed, they want to remind themselves, and they help their community see, hey guys, don't just think we're lucky. This is not just luck and good fortune. This is God at work in our world, moving in Cyrus's heart to bring us back to the land. Let's not forget that. And so they celebrate, first of all, God's faithfulness. The second thing they, they celebrate is the completion of a foundation. Now, I don't know about you, but foundations are not very exciting to me. If you've ever been on a building project, it's like the foundation is done. It's like, okay, where's the rest of it? Like, we, we're supposed to have a big building here. And so they, they complete the foundation. And it's like, all right, party time. Like, wait, what? Seriously, we're going to cover this stuff up with something better. And so it can be shocking that they start and they celebrate the foundation. A part that's, yes, important, but... It's not going to be the part where you go and, and worship God in the future. It's just a substrate to all of that. Why start there? Well, part of celebration is that if we don't stop and celebrate, we're always going to wonder, when is that point? Because in our productively driven world, as soon as you get one project done, guess what? There's more in the way. You've got to go to the next one. And if you never stop and celebrate a completion of a task, it just feels like we're uh, gerbils on a wheel, just... Just going to the next thing. 
And celebration helps mark a thing got completed. We had a major win. And so one of our staff team's um, norms that we're trying to encapsulate is to celebrate, to stop and say, hey, team, we just, we just accomplished something. We just had VBS. That was great. Trying to mark those moments where we've accomplished something together. And this, whoa. Hopefully we're okay. Celebration is about marking those moments where God has allowed you to accomplish something important. And so they stop and they celebrate this very small beginning. It's going to take them decades. And I think one of the fears of celebrating early in a project is that, well, what if the project gets held up? And guess what? It does. It's going to take them decades to complete the temple. As we, if you want to go on and read Ezra chapter 4 later today, you'll see that the people of the land oppose them. Red tape holds up the project. They have to renew their energy, and God has to send the prophet Haggai back to say, hey guys, don't forget, you came back to build a temple, you haven't quite finished the job. And so if they would have waited, here's what would have happened. The older generation that returned would have never gotten to see the celebration. Because by the time they get back to building the temple, they would have died off. So part of why you celebrate is because the people who are with you now We'll get to mark that as a win, too. You can't always wait to celebrate. Celebrating small beginnings is important. One of the things I had to learn while doing PBJ is that I had to learn to celebrate other people's small beginnings. And so as I've done PBJ for several years, I realized God was calling me to riskier things, and I was like, God, that's pretty tough. But then I, w- I would help others start into the process, and I realized sometimes, like, whoa, like, God's calling me to some pretty risky stuff. This seems, well, this person is doing pretty kind of elementary, it would almost seem. And in my heart, there would be this, this judgmental attitude like, really, you're starting there? But what I've come to discover is that I don't get to pick where somebody else's growth point is. And so for them, it might be just saying hi to the neighbor. That might be a huge growth point. It might come in and be like, hey, Pastor Ben, guess what happened? I just said hi to my neighbor. And I might think in the back of my head, Okay, that, I was hoping you were doing that before, but I'll, we'll work with that and say, you know what? That is a step in the right direction. And so learning to celebrate. So you might be in a place in your spiritual growth where you're at a different level. And someone else is excited about this new place where they've grown. Guess what? Celebrate with them. If they can celebrate a foundation, we can stop and celebrate. Yes, that new place of reaching out to your neighbor, that new place of relationship, that's positive growth. Let's celebrate. Let's mark that as a win. If we don't, they'll often feel judged or, okay, you know what? I'm not going to share that anymore. And so you might not get let in on the next moments of growth that happen for them. So be sure to celebrate small beginnings, just like these returning exiles did. And the third thing about this is that they have mixed responses. So they hold this celebration, and here's this foundation. Again, you're not going to see much of the remaining part of the structure. But they have mixed responses to this. So here's what happens. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men, who had seen the first house, they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy. So you've got two responses here. You've got weeping aloud, and you've got shouting for joy. So that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. So here they are, they're at the celebration, and they unveil these foundations. Whoa! And some are there, and they're rejoicing. Yeah, this is the only temple they have ever seen. They're excited. On the other hand, there's a generation that came back, and they remember the glory They remember Solomon's temple, the gold. You can imagine how this plays out, perhaps. You know, you have the old guy walking past this young 20-year-old priest who's over there chiseling a block to fit in the foundation, and he's like, man, we used to have those things laced with gold. That's nothing. And so here's this young man like, huh? What am I supposed to do with that? You can imagine, here's one generation that's disappointed, like, this is lackluster, guys. Like, we, we had it far better. And then a new one saying, whoa, we get a temple. We've been doing this without a temple in the, in the Babylon. So you have this mixed response. And the text 
doesn't condemn either one. It lets them both stand there. Because the emphasis is on the great shout. It says that it was heard far away. And so you had this mixture of weeping and joy coming together to make this great sound. Now, I realize we're not building a temple here today. But in many ways, we're still rebuilding after a pandemic. And as we come back, I think there's some of us in the weeping category. We're mourning some things. And then then there's those of us who are rejoicing. So I might list a few things here. So for instance, you might be mourning today that as you look around the room, some of your good friends aren't here with us. On the other hand, you might be rejoicing. I just met somebody who says he's been watching our live stream from another state and is here today, here today for his first time. There are some people who are now participating in a worship services that were shut in. All they ever had was audio sermons, and now they have to be part and feel a part of this in a new way. Some of you are mourning that we don't wear masks. Some of you are rejoicing that we don't wear masks. Um, some of you might be re- mourning that we don't pass offering plates anymore. Some of you might say, yeah, great. I don't have to worry about offering plates. I don't have to sign up for one more thing to do during a Sunday morning service. Some of you are mourning it's hard to find volunteers in your ministries. Others might be feeling, I'm rejoicing because I found one that fits me. Some of you might be sad that we're doing something like PBJ. You might think it's too elementary. You might think you don't want to do anything like that at all. And others might be rejoicing, hey, we're talking about outreach on a consistent basis. And so, as we look around our room, I'm pretty sure we've got people who are weeping and rejoicing over a whole bunch of things. And the challenge for us today is to make space for each other to be there. To make space for the person to, to mourn, because there, there's been things that have, lo- we've been lo- that have been lost. But there are new things, too. And the temptation is to make sure everyone else is feeling what we're feeling. But how can we hear from each other today? those who are weeping, those who are rejoicing. So I'm going to ask you to do something that's pretty crazy. I had a teaching methodologies teacher one time who said, don't be afraid to be a fool for the Lord's sake, so I'm going to do that today. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite you all to stand up. We're going to have a public response. We're going to mimic what was going on there. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. And if you're in a place where you're feeling joyful, you're excited about all kinds of things, and this can, not, this can be more than just church life. It can be personal life. It can be world events. If you're feeling hopeful, I want you to give a cheer of some kind. Yeah, woo! All right, so that, that's, that's one response if you're over there. If you're over here in your morning, you're like, man, it's just heavy. I want you to let out a big sigh. Ah. Now, the goal is just to have a loud noise, right? So the text... It's about the great shout. So I want our neighbors over here to hear us. So I'm going to count to three, and wherever you are, you you decide whether you're on the morning side or the rejoicing side. So here we go. One, two, three. Yeah! All right. Go ahead, take a seat. Thank you. So they had this mixture of rejoicing and weeping together. And that was part of that community. And they had to make sense of how they were going to move forward in the midst of that. And so what I invite us to do today is just make space for someone who's in a different place than you are. To give them freedom to be mourning or to give freedom to be rejoicing. At the same time, there are also exciting things that have happened in the past couple of years. So... Those of you driving through Blazier Drive, you might have noticed a set of white new buildings taking shape over here. They're finally inhabited. As of February, they've opened up. It's called Ashton Commons, and I've been in conversation with them. And I was really shocked. My first meeting, I went there, and I thought, okay, I need to ask this, kind of like the sales tactic, say, how can we help you? And the director actually said, how can we serve your mission? And I was like, "Uh, that's not the question I thought I was going to be asked today. (laughs) They're very open to having us come and hold a service there. We look forward to seeing what God has brought to us, to our doors. 
there's been years I've been praying and asking God, well, what does it look like to, to love people in our community? And it hasn't been clear. Like, do we go to North Park and get the runners? Like, it, it just wasn't clear. And all of a sudden, it's like, boom, I'm going to take Trader Horn and make it a retirement facility. Who knows what God will bring from that? We live moving into the future with hope that God is doing good things. And it's hard to judge where things are going to end up based upon where things are in the middle. It really is. So in Haggai chapter 2, Haggai comes to the older generation and says, yeah, I know it's nothing compared to what it used to be. But then he makes this interesting promise. This next house is going to be even more glorious than the former one. And I imagine they're sitting there like, okay, I don't see any gold in there. I don't see much silver. How is this more glorious? The other interesting thing about that prophecy is that we never have an indication or a narrative story of God's glory filling that temple like we do with the first temple and the tabernacle. So, hmm, how is it more glorious? Unless, of course, there was a time when a young man would walk in there, one whose glory was as the only begotten Son of God, and he would go into that place and call it his father's house of prayer. Maybe the glory wasn't just this light falling upon him. Maybe it was actually a person who was going to go and walk into that same space. And God would come home to his people. You see, that house would be more glorious because Christ would walk in it. He would grace it with his presence. And so it's hard to know in the middle of a story where you're going to end up. And even those who are weary and, and mourning the loss of what that first temple was could anticipate the future glory that the second temple would get to house one day. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're in all kinds of different places. We're mourning what's happening on the geopolitical scene. We could be excited about new opportunities. Lord, I pray you'd give us space to hold each other. For those who are sad, Lord, help us hear their sadness. For those who are rejoicing, Lord, help us have the ability to rejoice with those who rejoice. Be with us now, Lord. Help us see the opportunities in front of us. Be with us, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.